Okay. Welcome to Math 150, Section 2, Lecture 8 Time. I'm in the middle of renumbering the lectures a little bit for the math things on the web. I will probably spend some time while watching an episode of Star Trek to suggest all the numbers and getting everything to match with the new numbers. We don't have multiple lecture eights, multiple lecture nines, and stuff like that. So what I want to do today is there were two questions. Uh, one was on finding a limit, and then the other was finding maximum. And what we'll do is we'll do the limit first. And then we will talk a little bit about how do you find maximum minima in one dimension and then extend that to other dimensions. So we want to take the limit of x, y, z goes to one is negative one one. Uh, it's going to be y, z of x, z of x, y over one plus XYZ. A lot of times, if you are listening, you can hear the math screaming at you on what to do. You have a limit. What limit law do you want to do? And you thought, what limit law you would want to try? Well, do we have a sum of two objects? There are sums inside, but the first operation is not a sum. What's the first thing? A quotient. So what would you like to try to do? The quotient. So when you see a quotient, first thought can be, huh, where's the quotient be? So what must be true to use the quotient in? The two limits must exist, and what else? Not divided by zero. So the numerator, well, if we go to the point one, negative one, one, the numerator goes to negative one times one plus one times one plus one times negative one. So what does the numerator go to? Numerator goes to, they go, all right, numerator, well, if you can't do job numerator. Denominator, let's see how the denominator is doing. So the denominator is going to go to one plus one times negative one times one, which is zero. So this is a D and E does not exist. And they ask in the first section, you could you say does it go to like maybe negative infinity or positive infinity? Is that possible? So let's look at what's going on. If x and z are one, and y is a little bit larger than negative one, excuse me, what's a little bit larger than negative one? Negative 0.9, negative 0.99, because it's a negative number, so if you're a little bit larger, you're a little bit less negative. So if y is around negative 0.999, this product will be a little bit less than one, the denominator will be positive, it's going to go to positive. So it'll be going to negative one over positive, it'll be going to negative infinity. Conversely, if y is like negative 1.1, and the denominator would be negative, negative over negative is a positive, so it'll be going to plus infinity. So it clearly doesn't exist because I can get it to go to plus infinity or minus infinity without too much trouble. If, however, I were to square the denominator, Now you can actually say it's going to negative infinity. And in this case, you can say if you want negative infinity. If you want to say the limit doesn't exist, that's fine. Some people have differences of opinion as to should we allow negative infinity to be allowed? Should we allow plus infinity to be allowed? I'm fine with allowing plus and minus infinity to be allowed. Wait, why can you just square? No, no, because I'm saying if I consider this problem instead. Ah, this new problem is being being a blackboard. I can simply put on parentheses and just square. So in that case, slightly different problem, I would then be able to say if I want to eliminate this thing. Yes. Um, I just want to say that y like Well, because before the denominator could alternate between being a positive number close to zero and a negative number close to zero. And because it could alternate like that, I could flip-flop, flip-flop. Think of the function 
and think about what happens if we send x to zero. If you send x to zero to the positive, it's going up like this. If you send it to the negative, it's going like that. So if I look at that, that clearly has no loop. But if instead I squared them and look at view that is going up here, now it would look like that. And now I would want to say that that limit does exist. Okay. Any other questions on this? So what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about what does the view of mean, and I want to talk about something they taught me in calculus before you were born that seems to have been removed from the curriculum, but they're really good ways to do some proof studies. So as time as point A, the limit as h goes to zero of f of a plus h minus f of a over so if I have a function of one variable, how do you tell where the maximum minimum of the How do you find it? What do you, what do, you do? Well, you have to do it equal to zero. There's not going to be entirely plot. So tell me where my speed is lost. Okay. Ready? So, not where my derivative was zero, it was at the end. So, where the derivative is zero is one of the things to check. So, max and minima. That's the critical point. That's the point of that zero. And you check the boundary. I deliberately run into the wall, try to make this move. But if you will always remember, one of the biggest things people forget to do is to check the boundary. In one variable calculus, is it unreasonable for me to ask you to check the boundary? Is this a huge ask? How many points are we talking about? Okay, this is not a big deal in one variable. Pattern. If we start to consider the generalization of several variables, how many points are on the boundary? Infinitely many. Going from two to infinity is a big change. This is a situation where the geometry is fundamentally different in several variables and one variable. The hope is that we can still somehow use the ideas from one variable calculus. But it's going to be a lot harder in several variables. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what that derivative means. So what does it mean if the first derivative is positive? Let's say x comma a is greater than zero. What does that mean? Increases to the right, decreases to the left. So if I think about what's going on, here's the point A. The first derivative is positive. So I often like to write it like this. Here's my x axis, and we'll go ahead and I'm going to put f prime just to give me a little hint of this one. And if my first derivative is continuous, then if it's positive at a, it's positive in a small neighborhood. If my speed is 16 miles an hour, I'm very amazing, but it's also still going to be around 16 miles per hour, a little bit before and a little bit after. So if you think about what's going on, if the first derivative is positive, f prime of a is a positive number. If h is positive, I increase time by a little bit. What must be true about the numerator? So if that's positive and that's positive, what must be true about the numerator? Positive. So f of a plus h has to be larger than f of a. So if I let time go by a little bit further, I've got to be a little bit higher. If I let h be negative, if I go back a little bit in time, if this is positive and this is negative, what must be true about the numerator? Negative. And now f of a plus h must be less than f of a. So I have to look a little bit like this. So 
I know that if my first derivative is positive, then I'm increasing to the right, decreasing to the left. If the first derivative is negative, it's the opposite. So this is a tremendous amount of information in the first derivative. So if x prime of a is greater than zero, could you be at a maximum or minimum? Well, you're at the end point. So as long as you know that the end point, you can't be at a maximum or minimum. So we'll say no max, no, and it's always the end point. What about if f prime of a is less than zero? No maximum or minimum. So if f prime of a is equal to zero, if a max or a min, is that correct? No. What do I have to write instead? It could be. It could be. If a max or min is candidate. So if you take the function of an x and x2, as prime of x is e x squared, as prime of zero is zero. But if I plot the function, it does not have a maximum or minimum of zero. What goes wrong is the second derivative vanishes. Okay. Candidate, we have to remember that it's a candidate. You want to have lots of candidates. In this particular setting, when you go to find the maximum or minimum. So the few candidates to the left four. So, so our goal is to try to understand where a function has a maximum or minimum. Boundary points not so bad in one dimension. Finding where the first order is zero, not so bad. And now we have some tests from one variable calculus. Anybody remember the name of the first test? First derivative test, and the name of the second test. The first derivative So, this x, this x prime, here's my special point A. I would say the first derivative is zero. Because I need that if I want to have a chance of having a maximum moment. I must imagine that the sign of the first derivative look like this. Has anybody seen pictures like this? There's at least one person saying that. So if the first derivative is negative, what does that mean about the value of the function? Decreasing. So it's decreasing down to here. And now the first order becomes positive, so now what happens? It's increasing. So what do we have? We have a minimum. And if instead if we have positive to zero to negative, what would we have? Not so much. If you remember that there is such a thing as the first derivative test, there's actually a very quick way to remember which way it goes. Let's take the function a of x is x squared, a prime of x is 2x, and for each of you, we record that a double prime of x is 2. We'll let b of x be negative x squared, b prime of x is negative 2x. And the double prime of x is moving at six. So it's the up and the down parabola. Is this a maximum or minimum? Minimum. And so this one is the maximum. So as long as you remember that there's such a thing as the first derivative test or the second derivative test, you can re-derive which way it goes by just looking at these two parabolas. And when I look at the first derivative, it goes negative zero positive as I go around zero. Oh, okay, so the negative zero positive has to be the minimum. 
if I look at this one, it goes positive zero negative. It's a maximum. So positive zero negative action maximum. So if you forget what the first derivative test is, you can actually restore your memory by looking at this again. Okay, building on the success of the first derivative test, we now turn to the second derivative test. And so here's x, here's x prime, here's f double prime, here's the point, the point, of point A where the first derivative is zero. Let's assume the second derivative is positive. Has anybody seen cross reference to the second derivative? If I tell you a function derivative is positive, what does that tell you about the function? The increase. If I tell you f double prime is positive, what function does that give me information about? F prime. So we should write f double prime as f prime prime. Right? It's the derivative of f prime. And the whole point is a derivative gives you information about whether or not the original function is increasing or decreasing. For f double prime, what's the original function? F prime. And so now if I tell you that f double prime is positive, what must be true about f prime near the point A? It's increasing. Now, if f prime is zero at A and it's increasing, what must be true about f prime a little bit before a? It must be negative. It's increasing up to zero, so it's going to be negative. What must be true now a little bit past a? Positive. So what does that mean? Well, f prime is negative, so my function is increasing and it's increasing. Well, so, oh, wait a minute. Negative zero positive for the first derivative? Oh, now I can just use the first derivative. So we actually get the second derivative happens by using the first derivative. What's nice is rather than having to calculate the signs of the function in the small neighborhood, we just use one number. Is f double prime of a positive or negative? And again, if you forget which way you can say, ah, here we go. The second derivative is positive, it's a minimum. The second derivative is negative, it's an maximum. You can remember which way to go by just looking at those special polynomials. Which do you think is easier, evaluating the second derivative at one point or checking the signs in the negative? Probably the second derivative. It could be it's the pain to calculate another derivative, but usually I think this is easier. There are some problems where it's going to be clear that you have a maximum or minimum. There's a problem of ground problem is one of them. But technically, what should you always do? Check and see, am I at a maximum or minimum? The following story is almost surely false, and it's almost surely a joke, but I like it. It's funny. It illustrates a really good point for I would say. The story goes that when people were working on the self former and the self fighter, obviously they were trying to minimize or all those They're trying to maximize silence or self. And the way the joke goes is they didn't check to see for one of the things that they were designing, whether or not they were at a maximum or minimum, and they actually did like, we're over here from Almost surely this is false. But there will be situations where if you don't check, you might actually get the wrong point. But what happened is, God like forbid, the second derivative down. Third derivative. Third derivative. Why might the third derivative also be answered? The hope is that eventually you get to a function that has at some point one of the derivatives that's not zero. Later this semester, we will see a function where all of its derivatives are zero at a point that the function is not zero. And the function actually is a very simple form. Okay. So we've got our first derivative test, we have our second derivative test. Now let's try to find uh, maximum minima. So I'm going to start with a 
nice problem that we talked a little bit about before. We'll do it initially as top one exercise, and then we'll shift and do it again in top two, or then top three, and you'll see that the top three is much, much worse. But that's because it's such a nice top one problem. It's going to illustrate really good concepts that we can use in other things. Any potential econ major? So you will eventually do the branch multiplier to continue and do math and economics, and that's what's going to be a nice way behind the world in the population. So we'll do the classic problem again. And so Palmer Brown do not consider any rectangular or any kind that's not rectangular. You're given x plus y equals x to some perimeter, and you want to maximize the area to the left hand side. It's not too bad to do this directly. You could say a of x is x times x minus x. Is fx minus x. Because if x plus y equals f, you can solve for y in terms of x. This is using y is f minus x. What is the range of, oh, sorry, x squared? What is the range of possible x? So zero, less equal to x, less equal to x. I right, hear the end point is not going to be a problem. A of zero equals A of F equals zero. We have zero area at the end point. Those are not going to maximize the area. We need to find the critical point. We get a prime of x is less than f minus 2x. Therefore, a prime of x equals 0 implies f minus 2x equals 0 implies x equals f over 2, which then leads to y equals f over 2. If you were to plot this, you would actually get it immediately. Here's zero, here's f, and you'll see it's a parabola. It says zero at zero and f. The vertex is in the middle. So this is the standard follow ground plot. Is there anything I should have done that I didn't do? What should I not do? So what do I need to do? I have to do one at a time. So if I do a double time of x, I get negative two. Negative two, that's the trouble like this is the maximum. I know from advanced results and analysis that if I have a continuous function on a closed bounded set, it's not Take its maximum and fundamental. I know there has to be a maximum. This is probably going to be the maximum. So I should really check and show by looking at the second division. Any questions on this? What I want to do is I want to briefly talk about a related problem that has a truly brilliant, elegant way of looking at it. So follow that has many things. One of them. Is Arthur Curry. Does anybody know who Arthur Curry is? A new star. It's a superhero that enjoys the walk. Aquaman. So Aquaman is trying to build a pen for his ship. And because the fish is not going to go on land, Aquaman only needs to be five. So now we would have x plus 2y is the perimeter, and we want to maximize x times y. You 
basically that you could do this in a very similar way as what we did for final math. And now it's just y equals x minus t over 2, or maybe you write x as t minus t1. There is a way to solve this without using calculus because we know the final ground problem. So this is what you call it. You care about half. So while Aquaman is making this tend to this fish, where do you think Thomas Brown is? Going? Thomas Brown is making a tent for cow. And let's say Thomas Brown makes his tent at the boundaries of water land. You read that whatever is optimal down here. Give you the best rectangle. A fish would be the same as what's the best rectangle for cow to flow. So if I flip it and I basically double the perimeter, it's the original final ground problem. The original final ground problem is if you have a rectangle and you have a fixed amount of fencing, what's the optimal shape? A square. This must be a square. What must this be? Half the square. So the solution is x must be twice that. And that's just really nice that you can solve that problem without doing any of the calculations. Okay. Now let's look at this as a multi year calculus problem. Because at the end of the day, it really is a multi year calculus problem. We have a function of two periods. And so, one of the advantages of flipping the lectures is we actually have time to go a little bit more leisurely through some of these concepts. So, we have on the ground in the middle, maybe it's a little home. So we have g of x and y is x plus y minus x equals zero. This is a constraint equation. We must satisfy the constraint equation. x plus y minus x has to be zero. And we want to maximize f of x, y. Does anybody have any idea what objects might be useful to study for this multi variable calculus problem? What might we want to compute? What do you think might play a role here? What did we compute in one dimension to try to find maximum of the other? The derivative. What do you think might play a role here? Partial derivative. Yeah. Let me just write them down. <laughs> like rate of g is the g dx to g dy. And what a surprise how much was a really nice function for us. I want to take the root of x plus y minus f. With respect to x. What's the derivative of that with respect to x? One. What's the derivative of this with respect to y? One. I wouldn't be shocked if this plays some role in the analysis. Let's calculate the gradient of x. And that would be the vector. Partial up, partial x, partial up, partial y. All right, the function is a little bit more involved than us telling you so. What's the derivative of x times y with respect to x? Y. And what is the derivative with respect to y? Okay. So these are reasonable things to have in front. Now, what does it mean for functions to be good functions? In one variable, we have the standard limit definition 
f of a plus h minus f of a over h. And we saw that was not the best way to look at it for function several variables. And we saw that what we really want to do is we want to keep the tangent line definition of the derivative. The tangent line does a really good job approximating. We want to generalize that to subtract off the tangent point. So we want f of xy minus f of let's say ax ay minus dx dx at a point um, ax ay. X minus a y x plus minus yes y at the point a x a y y minus a. That's the numerator in the tangent plane of our plane. Here is where we started. Here is where we end up. So they still up. Where we ended up is essentially where we stop. Plus. How much I'm moving in the x direction times the x point? How much I'm moving in the y direction times the y -term. And the idea is for the function to be differentiable, this tangent plane approximation should be very close to our function. We talked about how we could be right. This is the same as yes, 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 y. Dotted with x minus ax, y minus ay. Or well, if you want, the gradient of f dotted with x minus ax, y minus ay. Okay. Imagine I give you two guns. And I fix the length, but I allow you to change the orientation. Okay. How can you get those two vectors to have as large as a dark product as possible? How would you align them? Parallel. Because if they're perfectly aligned, if I give you two vectors, the dark product is the length of these, the length of W. Times the cosine of the angle. If I fix the length, the only thing that changes is the cosine of the angle. So the largest the dot product can be is if they align. How would I get the dot product to be a smaller part? This is very simple. But not, but not as small as possible. Probably the opposite direction. So if they're going in the opposite direction, then the cosine of theta is negative. And then you have as small as possible in magnitude, then you want it to be perpendicular. This allows us to actually answer a question what the hell does the gradient of f represent? In one dimension, the first derivative is telling you how the function is changing. If you remember when we did the equations of lines, we rewrote the equation of a line y equals mx plus c, and we replace that number m with a vector, one comma m. There was really a vector, there was really a direction going on to the line. A line is a point, and all the things going off in that direction. Over here, ah, it looks like gradient vectors give us some information. If I have a chain, how can I find the way to make my function f of x y change the maximum amount possible? Well, f of x y is approximately this. You think it's constant. So I want this dot product to be as large as possible. What direction should I take my change? How can I make the change as large as possible? Which direction should I go? Has the gradient of God in the field? How can I make this dark part of the body What direction do I choose for this? But nothing else. The gradient of right. This is what my, my two vectors have fixed length. 
And this one I'm evaluating at the point your AX, AY, with respect to your specs. This fact I can change a little bit in terms of where I put the X quietly, so I can move things around a little bit. If I want this spike to be as large as possible, I want this to be the direction where you go. So where you go point in the direction where X changes how or if I want to make my function as bad as possible, that's the direction I want to move in. What if I want to decrease as much as possible? What direction would I choose? If I'm in the direction of the green up, I'm increasing the fast as I can. What if I want to decrease the fast as I can? Negative. You want in the other direction. Right. If you see, you know, a video or an act murder, I think I got some great commercials for that. Murder. What direction should you choose? Negative. You look at see. I want to go in the opposite direction. Right. So here, yeah, if I want to get away, I would go in the opposite direction. If I want to increase, I would go in that direction. What happens if I go in, if I go perpendicular to the gradient? Zero. What would that? Moving is no change. There would be in that direction, the function is not changing. But maybe it will change if I move in another direction. So let's you know we'll talk a lot more about the case. Let's revisit what we have now. So we have calculated the gradient of f and the gradient of g. So g is our constraint function. If we didn't have any constraints, we'll just make x and y as wide as we can. So we have some constraints on that. So if we plot what the constraint means, we have the constraint is x plus y minus x plus zero. Okay, that's an equation of a line with a slope of negative one. And at every point, this is the gradient of g. The gradient g is always in the direction of no, northeast. It's always in the direction of a line of slope one. Imagine we're on constraint line. You basically can either move down or we can move up. Okay. If the gradient of f has any component in our direction, then this dot product would be. Either positive or negative, if you didn't increase the GDP. We don't want the gradient about to have any component in the direction we're moving. So what's the direction of the gradient about? It's y comma x. So what would it what would we need? We would need y comma x to be pointing out like this. There's only one choice when the gradient of f is going to be. Perpendicular to the tangent, to the direction along the constraint of what direction do you need gradient of f to be? It's going to be in the direction of 1 1, it's going to be perpendicular to this line. If the gradient of f was like this, we can write this vector as something in the direction of the constraint line and something perpendicular. And the amount that's in the direction of the constraint line would give us a little bit of an increase if we went down. So as long as the gradient of x has some component in the direction of motion, we can't get a maximum. The only candidate we have when we can have a maximum is if the gradient of f is perpendicular to the tangent. It's got to be 100 percent in the direction of the normal. So when is yx in the same direction as 1, 1? That's the only time yx is in the same direction as 1. We want yx to be in the same direction as 1, 1. So if x equals 3, what value would y have to be? If x equals 7, what would y have to be? So we need. Well, uh, 
parallel to the gradient of g, so we need x equal y. As x plus y minus x equals zero, that implies x equals y equals f over zero. And not surprisingly, we get the same result as before. So we will do more with this. This is the basics of the Ron Hall problem. But the key point for today is the geometric interpretation of what the gradient is. It's very easy to just calculate things and just manipulate symbols. I don't want you to manipulate symbols. I want you to stop and think and ask. So what does the gradient about? What does that represent? It's the direction of maximum change. Oh, okay. I want to move in that direction. What if you're not allowed to move in that direction? Oh, that's where these constraints come from. And say, look, if I could move any freely, if I could move freely, I would move in that direction. But I can't move freely, that's going to constrain my possibility to maximize. I can even do a lot more on that way. So I want to end with a maximization problem that somebody asked me. And so I'm going to give you a function of two variables, x and y. If you want, think of x and y as your location on your surface or who you count, and think of f of x, y as maybe your height or your temperature. And we want to figure out where are we highest, where is the hottest, something with an h. And then since this is a problem from, from the book, not surprisingly, the numbers are going to be chosen so everything comes out really nice. So the function is g is f of x y is a third of q plus four y q minus x to the fourth minus y. And we want to maximize. So the first question is when you look at this, do you think the function has a maximum? Well, let's look at what happens. If x is very, very large, positive and negative doesn't matter. X to the fourth still eight thirds x cubed. Right? Think of that to the quadrillion. Quadrillion to the fourth is much larger than eight thirds times the quadrillion cubed. Similarly, the negative y to the fourth tells the four y cube. So if x and y, are, if one of them is really large, it's going to become negative. So if you draw a circle with a tremendous radius, once you go sufficiently far out, the function is going to be negative. At zero, zero, the function is zero. So there will be a maximum inside this radius. Once you're outside, it's all negative, but somewhere here is the max. Okay. So we have a function of two variables. Let's calculate the gradient of that. Yes, 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 you are. What's the derivative with respect to that? What was the derivative of eight thirds x cubed with respect to x? Eight x squared. And now you can see, ah, okay, that's why we had a three moving on. What's the derivative of a four y cubed with respect to x? Zero. Derivative of negative x to the four. And the four x cubed. And then the derivative of negative y to the fourth with respect to x is zero. All right. If I take the derivative now with respect to y, the term is zero. The term is going to be 12 y squared. Zero. And then the last term is going to be negative 4 y cubed. And so this is the gradient of f. So how would I find my candidate for where my function is back to what I thought? Yeah, to so find critical points. Find critical points 
И они как раз будут сделать, ну, сделать так. А это не... Somebody likes them. What can you factor in the first equation? Yeah, four x squared. You get four x squared times two minus x equals zero. And for the second, you factor out of four y squared, and you get three y and the three minus y equals zero. And now surprisingly, these are nice problems. The x equals zero, zero, and two, y equals zero, zero, and three. So what are my candidate points to check? What am I saying? The first one tells us x is either zero or two, and the second one tells us y is either zero or three. So what are the possibilities that I have to start? Zero, zero. And then the main thing is you want to make sure you don't miss anything. So I chose x equals zero, y equals zero. So the next one will be x equals zero, y equals three. Then I'll do x equals two y equals zero, and finally x equals two y equals zero. So there are four points I need to check. Is it a terrible ask to have you check four points? No. I actually don't think you need to check any point. I think you can just look at it and say which one you have to be in. And the reason is if I put in zero, zero, the function is zero. If x is very small and close to zero, which is larger, x cubed or x to the fourth? If x is a small positive number, which is larger, x cubed or x to the fourth? X cubed. Would you rather have one half cubed, which is one eighth, or one half to the fourth, which is one sixteen? So if, if the number is small, the higher power becomes the smaller in absolute value. If the number is large, the higher power becomes the larger in absolute value. So if x is a small positive number, this is going to be positive. If y is a small positive number, this is going to be positive. So my maximum can't be when either x or y is zero. So gone, 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 without even doing any algebra, I know it has to be the function. We have about uh, one minute left. I'm not going to show you how to do this problem without using more figure with help. If you have a function of several variables and you want this to be an honest to goodness multi variable calculus problem, those variables should be interacting with each other. I can write this as a third x cubed minus x to the fourth plus four y cubed minus y to the fourth. I want to maximize this function, but I can regard it as two separate one dimensional problems, and I can do each one by itself. Right? And so if I just try to maximize this one, I'll end up getting x equals two. And if I just try to maximize this one, I'll just get y equals two. So because there's no interaction between the x's and the y's, I can solve each one individually. So in this regard, this is essentially a really good problem or a really bad problem. You can bypass all the multivariate calculus. So in some sense, it's not a generic problem, but in another sense, it's really good because now we can solve it another way and we can check and see if our answer to multivariate calculus is right. Whenever you're able to check answers, that's always a great thing to do. All right, so this is a good place to stop. Have a great week.